Radiant Church, it's so good to be with you. What an honor and a privilege to be joining you on Seek First Wednesdays, even here, just online, over the camera. I absolutely love your church, and I love and adore your pastors. Some of my favorite people, and I really mean that. And I just want you to know, here from California, Jesus Culture, we are such so honored to be running with you and partnering with you to see revival in America. So I, I'm ready to jump into the Word today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to get them out, because in just a moment, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to land there in just a minute. One of the things that I think the body of Christ needs right now is prophetic clarity. When I say maybe more than ever, I kind of mean maybe more than ever right now with what God is wanting to do and where God is wanting to take us, I believe that as individual followers of Jesus and as the body of Christ, we need prophetic clarity. We need to know what God is doing. Without prophetic clarity, sometimes we encounter seasons, but they don't make sense. They're confusing because we don't have clarity about what God is doing. This disruption that we have experienced, I believe, is under something. I believe that if you look throughout Scripture, the pattern you see is that disruption leads to revival. But the season of disruption without prophetic clarity won't make sense to people and can many times just bring confusion and frustration. It's a little bit like in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, 1 is the, the story of disruption that happened in the church of Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem that was birthed in Acts chapter 2 was disrupted. From Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 7, about five years, there was growth, salvations, revelatory teaching, signs and wonders. There were some difficult times in those five years, but for the most part, it was an incredible time as the church was birthed and began to grow in incredible ways. But in Acts chapter 7, a disruption began when Stephen was martyred. Acts chapter 8, 1, it describes that because of persecution, the church scattered, people scattered. But Acts chapter 8, 1 doesn't make sense unless you understand Acts chapter 1, 8. The disruption in Acts 8, 1 was connected to Acts 1, 8. Because the disruption in Jerusalem resulted in revival in Samaria. Acts 1.8 is the mandate to preach the gospel in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts, ends of the earth. And so Acts, the, the moment in Acts 8.1 only makes sense when you understand the mission of Acts 1.8. We need prophetic clarity. We need churches and we need people who are clear about what God is doing in this hour. I believe with all of my heart, and I'm not just saying this to be here to cheerlead for you and to somehow kind of hype you up. I believe with all of my heart that the disruption that has happened in the nations is leading to an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, an awakening that awakens hearts by the love and power of God, a harvest that comes in that is unprecedented. This is what I believe. I believe it even individually. The disruption that's happened in your life is going to result in revival. I believe that sons and daughters are going to come home. I believe that many of you, there is a disruption that's happened and there are sons and daughters, there are spouses, there are siblings that are away from the Lord. And I believe the disruption that has happened, we are going to see the prodigals come home. Disruption leads to revival. Acts 8.1 is connected to Acts 1.8. And when I have prophetic clarity, when I understand seasons, when I understand what God is doing in that season, then I can engage it properly. I come prepared. This is one of the biggest problems just in general for believers, those that follow Jesus, is one of the things that I think confuses people the most, trips them up, discourages the most, is when they don't understand the season that they're in. When they're unaware 
or unclear about the season that they're in. I run into a, you know, I remember the first time that I went to Brazil, for whatever reason, Brazilians love Jesus culture and the music. And so we were going to go down to Brazil for the first time. And we had this whole out, massive outdoor kind of event planned. And we were going to do a couple cities. And, you know, it was the summertime in California. So I just assumed it would be the summertime in Brazil. And I remember I packed for the summertime, didn't check the weather report at all. And went to Brazil and showed up and it was rainy and it was cold and it was not the season I thought it was going to be. So I came unprepared. So now whenever I travel somewhere, I, you know, I make sure I check what the weather is so I can pack and prepare for that season. So many believers are, are wondering why they're so miserable and why they're freezing and why they're, you know, so tense. And it's like, well, because you're wearing you know, a tank top, sandals, and shorts in the middle of winter. You're not dressed, for, you don't know what season you're in. Sometimes we see people that are sweating and miserable and hot because they're wearing a jacket, you know, a parka and, and, and boots and gloves and a beanie in the middle of summer. When we recognize the season that we're in, we can engage properly with it. We can see clearly. I believe that right now one of the things God wants to do is give us prophetic clarity because Acts chapter 8, 1 can be confusing. Acts chapter 8, 1, where the church is scattered, disruption happens, can be confusing if you don't understand the, the connection to Acts 1, 8. I believe that one of the things God wants to do is give you prophetic clarity about the season the church is in and about the season you're in. And one of the things I believe this season of disruption has done, it has revealed. It's been a season of revealing, and it's been a season of invitation. It's been a season that's revealed where we've put our trust. It's a season that's revealed what we have relied on, what we have leaned on, what we have trusted in. See, this is one of those things where I told our church early on, I said, we're going to very quickly find out what kingdom we are anchored to. Because while the kingdoms of the world may be shaking all around us, while there may be great uncertainty all around us, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is unshakable. And so many times a disruption reveals what we're anchored to, what we've trusted in. And when our lives are shaking, it's simply a revelation or a revealing of what we've anchored our life to, what we've trusted in. And then it's a season of invitation where God invites us to anchor our lives in his kingdom and to trust him. I believe that we are in a season of revealing and a season of invitation, and the invitation is to trust God at a deeper level. The reality is, and I'm, this is where we're going to go today with the sermon, is that ultimately fruitfulness is connected to a life of trust. But, but one of the patterns, one of the themes we th see throughout Scripture is that God intends for your life, the mandate on your life is to bear fruit. The mandate of every believer is to bear fruit. John 15 says that you're to bear fruit, you're to bear a lot of fruit, and you're to bear fruit that remains, fruit that lasts, fruit that's healthy. You're to bear fruit. Every area of your life should be marked by fruit. Your relationships, your family, your marriage, your job, your future, your health, all of it should be marked by fruit. There should be fruit. And not only does the Bible say that we're to bear fruit, but here's the, here's the deal, we're to bear fruit in every season. The Bible makes it clear that we're to be people who in every season we bear fruit. See, I believe that one of the things that, is, one of the, one of the things that God is doing in this disruption is he's revealing where we put our trust. He's inviting us to a deeper, uh, a deeper realm of trust, inviting us to a deeper intimacy with trust, so that we will bear fruit. 
He's trying to get to his church to a place of fruitfulness. He's trying to get your life to a place of fruitfulness. Let me read this to you in uh, Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17, starting in verse 8, this is what it says. This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. But listen to this in verse 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence, or one translation says hope, is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Let me read that last line to you again. And never fails to bear fruit. One of the things I love about God is he's so invested and committed to your life bearing fruit. God is committed to your success. He is committed to every area of your life being fruitful and bearing greater fruit. That's what he's after. And so he just flat out tells you how to see that happen. You know, in America, we spend millions of dollars every year on on things that will help us with the secret to something. So you've known this, you've seen ads for it or whatever else where somebody comes and says, I want to share with you my secret to success. I want to share with you my secret to how I made millions. I want to share with you my secret to how I retired at 35 with a house in the Bahamas. You know, like, I want to share with you my secret to a thriving life. And people spend millions of dollars because in order to learn that secret, you've got to attend a seminar, you've got to buy a book, you've got to join a club, you've got to become a part of something. And so we spend millions of dollars in America to somehow learn the secret to someone's success. But see, God comes and says, I want you to be fruitful, so I'm just going to give you the secret for free. He just lays it out right there in Jeremiah. He just says, here it is. Here's the secret. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. If you trust in the Lord, you will bear fruit in every season. If you trust in the Lord, your, your leaves will never wither. They will always be green. And you don't have to be afraid when it's, when it's drought or when there's heat if you trust in the Lord. See, Jeremiah actually lays out two choices. God in Jeremiah says, well, there's actually two choices that are in front of you. Sometimes, and I want to say this about Christianity, sometimes we love to make something that's actually simple complex. I'm not saying it's not difficult. I'm not saying it's not hard at times. But so many times we want to make things complex, they're actually quite simple. And here's the simplicity of the message that God gives us. You can either trust in man or you can trust in God. Those are the two choices. I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember when the original Let's Make a Deal game show came out. Now, Let's Make a Deal is still on to this day with the host Wayne Brady. But if you remember the show originally in the 1960s with the host Monty Hall, And if you know the show, it was known for the contestants and the audience coming in these extravagant costumes and outfits and all this stuff. But part of the game was that Monty Hall, you know, a contestant might have a $100 bill, and Monty Hall would come and say, do you want to trade that $100 bill for what's behind door number one, what's behind door number two, or what's behind door number three? But, but the intrigue of the show, the tension of the show, the thing that got us to watch the show was that the contestant, nor do we know what's behind the doors. They don't say, well, behind door number one, 
is a set of hand towels. Behind door number two is a pile of rocks. And behind door number three is a brand new car and an all expenses paid vacation for you and 10 of your friends to the Bahamas. They, they don't, they, Money Hall doesn't say what's behind the doors, and so they have to guess. They have to guess what's behind the door and which one's the best choice. I'm convinced that if God was a game show host, he'd be a horrible game show host. Am I allowed to say that? Is that heresy? I'm just telling you right now that if God was a game show host, he would be horrible at that job because he would just tell you what's behind the doors. He would just tell you. Can you imagine if Monty Hall just told the contestants what was behind every door? If he said, listen, you got $100, but uh, you, can you can trade it for what's behind door number one, which is a set of hand towels, which are worth like $10. Or you can trade it for what's behind door number two, which is a pile of rocks, which is worth nothing. Or you can, or you can do door number three, and behind that's a, a brand new car and an all-expense-paid vacation to, for you and 10 of your friends to the Bahamas. Which door do you want to choose? Well, they, you would... You'd never have a loser. You would win every single time because Monty Hall told you what's behind the doors. See, God takes all the guessing out. He's like, here's your two options. You've got door number one, and it says, trust in man. You've got door number two, and it says, trust in the Lord. But then he tells you what's behind door number one. He says, you see that door that says, trust in the Lord? Here's what's behind that door, a cursed life. A cursed life. Now, that may sound dramatic. That may sound kind of like, like shocking, a cursed life. But what you have to understand is this. The Bible describes a cursed life as a life that doesn't bear fruit. This is the description in Jeremiah. A cursed life is simply a life that doesn't bear fruit. It's a life in, planted in salt lands, in the desert. There's no fruit coming from that life. So, so God says you can choose door number one, which says trust in man. But on the other side of that door is a cursed life. And then he says this, or you can choose door number two, trust in the Lord. And on the other side of that door is a blessed life. And you know what the Bible describes a blessed life as? A life that bears fruit. A life that bears fruit in every season. A life whose leaves are always green a life that doesn't fear heat or drought because they've planted themselves next to a stream. This, this is, there's two doors. These are the two choices. This is the invitation. And, and in times of disruption, we get a revelation of where we've put our trust. Where have I put my, it exposes what we've leaned on. Am I leaning on my own effort? Am I leaning on my job? Am I leaning on the economy? Am I leaning on a political office? Am I leaning on, what am I leaning on? It gets exposed. It's crazy because even as, even as clear as God is, and he's clear, he says, here's what's behind door number one, trusting man. Here's what's behind door number two, trusting the Lord. A, ble a cursed life or a blessed life. We still struggle sometimes to choose door number two. Sometimes our, our, our natural default is we just want to choose door number one. We want to choose the door of trusting in man. We want to trust the economy. We want to trust a person in a political office. We want to trust our own effort. We want to trust our own strength. We want to trust our own work ethic. Whatever else it is, that's what we want to trust. When we moved here to Sacramento um, seven years ago, I actually was born and raised in Reading and uh, lived there my whole life until I was 37. So I lived in Reading my whole life till I was 37, and uh, and and I played. I grew up playing basketball there. Uh, my two oldest kids grew up playing basketball there, and so we knew. Uh, we knew kind of all the basketball people and the coaches and the programs and the schools, but when we moved here, and my son was in second grade, third grade, I, we didn't know anybody. And I didn't, so it was all brand new. I, 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 I didn't know who the coaches were. I didn't know who the basketball programs were. I didn't know any of it. So my son goes in, he's going to third grade, and he decided that he really wanted to play basketball. He's serious about it. He, he really wanted, so he, want, he needed to play at a different level than just rec league. So we put him on, we went to trial for an AU team or like a travel club team. 
in town. And we go there, and there's 30 kids trying out. They're going to keep two teams of 10. And he tries out, and he gets cut. He doesn't make it. And I listen, listen, I get this, right? I get that parents have parent goggles when it comes to their kid and their kid's talent level. But I am telling you, without parent goggles, my son was in the top 10 of these 30 kids. No, no way he should have been cut. But he got cut. And, and nobody really knew who he was, and I didn't know anybody. And, and I mean, it sent me. I was struggling. I'm naturally competitive, but it was just beyond that. I was struggling. I couldn't believe they cut my kid. And I'm trying to make phone calls, and I'm trying to figure out who I can track down. I'm trying to figure out who I can talk to to say, like, hey, what can I do? And I think we made a mistake. And, um, and about day three of me spinning, I was spinning. And my son, he's fine. He's like, Dad, I'm good. I'm all right, Dad. And I'm like, well, I am not okay. You know, and, and about day three, I just realized, I'm like, why am I having such a hard time with this? And I remember getting with the Lord, and, um, and just as I was with the Lord, I just recognized I don't trust the Lord with my kids it's, it's basketball, basketball in the scope of life isn't that big of a deal. But this was about my son's heart. It was about something he cared about. It was possibly about his future. And I could not believe that somebody, you know, would, could somehow, like, make a decision on his future and hurt his heart like that. And I was so irritated by it. But I realized, I'm like, I don't, I don't think I trust the Lord fully with my kids. I had been choosing door number one. So I just sat with the Lord and I just said, God, I just, I choose door number two. I choose, I trust you with my kids. I trust you with my kids, God. I trust you with their heart. A week or two later, he tried out for another team in just the suburb over. He made the team and, um, and this has been, I guess, uh, uh, six years, six years later. Six years later, it's been the best situation ever for him. It's been the best program. Every coach he's had has been the right coach. He's made great friends. It's a, great, it's a better program than he got cut from. In fact, I remember the first time we played the team that he got cut from. Not only did we beat them. Okay, so not only did my son start on our team and we beat the team that cut him. So that's a, like that's just a side issue, right? But but it's an important part of the story. All right, it's an important part of the story that we whooped them. Not only that, I remember watching the coach on the other team that my son would have been playing for, and I just saw how he interacted with the kids, and I just realized, man, my son would not have thrived there at all. And I remember sitting in the stands, kind of getting a little bit choked up, kind of getting teary, and just going like, God, thank you for cutting my son. Forgive me for not trusting you. Thank you for cutting my son. It's crazy, guys. Sometimes, even when we know that door number two leads to a blessed life and door number one leads to a cursed life, we still want to choose number door number one in my finances and in my marriage and raising kids and in my future and in my health and in my safety and in the economy and in my job. Like, we still want to choose door number one. And I think it's because it's like, like, like our own effort, the strength of man, there's a false sense of security in it and protection. I would kind of equate it to when you were a little kid and what, what your blankets did. You know when you're a little kid and you're in your room and it's dark and you're a little bit scared and you're convinced that there's a a monster in the room but so what you do is you hide underneath the blankets and as long as you're underneath the blankets you feel safe as long as you're underneath the blankets you feel protected but 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 we all know if there's really a monster in there that blanket's not going to protect you <laughs> that blanket's not going to do anything to stop anybody right like we know that but man as a kid you felt protected, but it's, it's what's called a false sense of security. It's a false sense of protection. That blanket can't help you. And I think sometimes we choose door number one because, because it feels 
It's a false sense of protection. Our own effort, an economy that's stable, the right person in the right political office, the right job, whatever else it is, my own work ethic, my own strength. We have more confidence in that not realizing that our strength can't protect us. Our strength isn't a security. It's only when I choose door number one and I trust God and I submit to him and I surrender my life to him that truly I'm protected, that truly I'm secure, that truly I'm safe, that truly when the world around me is shaking, when the world is in drought, I am still green and bearing fruit because I have planted myself next to the stream that's called trusting the Lord. So here's the question. Because if we're honest with ourselves, me included, like I'm not saying that, and sometimes we trust the Lord in one area but not another area. It's not like across the board we never trust God. But there are areas that get revealed. And so the question is, is, well, how do I trust the Lord? Man, I'm struggling choosing door number two. I just keep reverting back to door number one for some reason. Here's what it is. I believe that this is a season of invitation for intimacy. Intimacy. Because trust is the result of intimacy. Simply put, it's this. The more I know God, the more I trust him. The more that I know God, the more I trust him. The more I know his nature, the more I know his character, the more I know how he works, the more I know how he thinks, the more I know how he operates, the more I know him, the more I trust him. See, sometimes we think that trust is just this blind leap of faith. But the Bible doesn't actually paint trust as a blind leap of faith. I grew up in a very Baptist, uh, conservative kind of environment. And so, uh, you know, we, words like encountering God and in his presence and face to face with him, these were not words or phrases that we used. And so because of that, though, we kind of were like, you just, just, just trust him. You know, it's just, just kind of like just a blind leap of faith. And, uh, and like the alternative is worse. Like, that's kind of what it was. But the Bible actually paints a different picture of how to get to trusting the Lord. Let me show you this to you in Psalms. If you have your Bibles, you can just jot this down real quick. Listen to this. Psalm 34, 8 says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Here it is again. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. I want to, again, the the word blessed means what? A fruitful life. So they say, you're blessed if you trust God. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. You're going to bear fruit if you trust God. But, But trust is a result of this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's an invitation to encounter, to experience, to taste, to see the goodness of God, the nature and the character of God. And when I know him, when I experience in him, when I draw closer in intimacy to him, the more I trust him. And the more I trust him, I live a blessed, fruitful life. Well, we know this, just even the natural. If I was, uh, you know, right now, Brandon is working the camera for me. And, and if I talked to Brandon and, and I said, hey, do you know John over there? You know, and he may not know John, but, but it, it, he doesn't know John. And I say, Brandon, do you trust John? Brandon isn't even going to tell me yes or no. He's going to say, I don't know John. I don't know John. How can I answer that question? I don't know him. So so when I ask Brandon if he trusts a guy he doesn't even know, he goes, I I don't know him. In the same way, God says, listen, you don't have to trust me blindly. I invite you to come and know me. 
to come and experience me, to come and encounter me. This is what Jesus did. Jesus came and revealed who the Father was. Jesus came to reveal the character and the nature and the heart of the Father. Because when I know the Father, I will trust the Father. Jesus came and he would do teachings. He would say, listen, how many of you earthly fathers, if your, if your child asks for a piece of bread, how many of you earthly fathers would give him a stone? No one. And he said, and how much better is your heavenly father? He was trying to see. See, Jesus came to reveal who the father was because the Israelites didn't know the father intimately. They knew God as creator. They knew God as righteous. They knew God as judge. But they didn't know him as father. And so Jesus comes to reveal who the father was. He's the one that when the woman's caught in adultery, he doesn't stone her. He's the one that would go find the outcast and the leper. He's the one that would go sit with the tax collector. He's the one that was kind to prostitutes. He's, he's the one, th this is, he was, he was revealing who the Father was. Because the more that we know the Father, the more we trust him. The more we know his nature, the more we know his character. This is why one of the biggest lies the, the lies that we believe that the enemy is after is to distort either our view of the Father or to distort what the Father thinks of us, his view of us. This is where the battle is. The battle is how I see the Father or how I believe the Father sees me. See, if I really knew who God was, when I fell and sinned, I wouldn't run from him, I would run to him. Because the Bible says that even when I am faithless, he remains faithful. That's just who he is. And when I draw close to him, when I encounter him, when I experience him, all of a sudden in intimacy I recognize, oh, you're faithful. Oh, you're faithful. Even when I've let you down, God, you remain true. Because you're a father that continues to move towards me. And you're gentle and you're kind. And so the more that I know God, the more that I trust him. See, this is why it's so important right now. The, the church, uh, th this is the whole point of where I'm trying to take you today. God wants you to bear fruit. He's trying to get you to a greater place of fruitfulness in every area of your life. He's trying to get your church to a greater place of fruitfulness. He's trying to get the body of Christ to a greater place of fruitfulness. But fruitfulness is connected to trust, and trust is connected to intimacy to knowing the nature and character of God. And so many things are connected to that. <clears throat> Hope, peace, faith, trust, these are all connected to knowing God. Those who know God will be strong and do great exploits. It's connected to that concept. But if you can imagine two things. When I was, um, when I was uh, in middle school, one of the things that my dad and I connected over was WWE. Uh, back in the day, it was called WWF, but WWE. And if you know WWE, it's, it's fake wrestling. And in essence, it's a male soap opera is what it is. What it is is just a male soap opera. And it's got these storylines that you follow, and it's got these matches that you watch, and it's this wrestling that's, you know, all scripted and all that. But, but we loved it. We'd watch it on Saturday or Monday or whenever it was on. And I even went to a few live events. I even went to a few live events. And uh, I went to a Royal Rumble, and I went to a couple other things. And, you know, back in the day, it was Hulk Hogan, Macho Man, Randy Savage. It was Demolition. It was, you know, uh, Hacksaw, Jim Duggan. It was all these guys. And, but my favorite, my favorite was uh, Ultimate Warrior. Ultimate Warrior, that was my guy. So if you've ever watched a match, it's the same storyline every single time. So if you can imagine me going to a live event, and I bring a friend with me who has never watched WWE, doesn't understand how it works or the storyline connected to it. 
okay? So we come, and I'm like, that's my favorite guy, Ultimate Warrior. He's going to be fighting this guy, the villain. And this is always how it works. There's some villain you hate, and there's a storyline that's been building up to this, and then now they're going to meet in this match. So the match starts, and I'm sitting up there with my friend who's never seen this before, doesn't know how it works. And uh, they're, 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 it's going along for a little bit, and all of a sudden, my guy starts losing. And he starts getting beat up. And the guy that we hate, he starts winning until it gets so bad that, that he knocks him down to the mat and he lays there on his face, lifeless. Uh, the guy next to me, he's worried. He's feeling stressed. He feels hopeless. He lost his peace. And he's like, this is bad. This is bad. I'm telling you, this is bad. And the whole time I'm there, I'm calm, I'm confident, I got my hope, I got my peace, and I'm telling him, just trust me, just trust me, because I know how this works, I know the storyline that's unfolding, sure enough, my guy's lifeless on the ground, and the villain doesn't pin him at first, he just begins to cheer, he begins to gloat. He begins to taunt the audience and the whole crowd. Thousands of people are booing him and they're jeering at him and all this type of stuff. And he's, he's, he's got his back to our guy and he's just out there taunting the crowd. And we're worried. And there's just a kind of a, a hush in the auditorium trying to figure out, watching our guy. And, my, and listen, the guy I brought, he's stressed. And I'm like, don't even worry about it, man. Don't even worry about it. Just trust me. I know what happens. And sure enough, because it's the same storyline every time in this male soap opera. All of a sudden, our guy that got beat up just starts twitching a little, just starts moving. And I'm like, oh, man, watch this. This is it right here. Sure enough, and all of a sudden you can see it just start, it's a buildup. It's just a buildup in the arena. And the, our guy starts twitching a little bit. The villain, he's not paying attention. He's still just, you know, uh, uh, you know at the crowd, taunting them, and our guy starts twitching. And all of a sudden, he just lifts his arm up. All of a sudden, he gets up on a knee, and the crowd just starts going crazy. And all of a sudden, our guy stands up. Crowd goes crazy. And, and all of a sudden, the villain turns around with this look in his eyes, and the whole time, I'm like, Watch this. It's about to be over. Get ready. This is the best part. And sure enough, our guy goes and hits him one time, pins him, does thing, matches over, we win. It's all good. Because I know the storyline. I didn't lose my hope. I didn't lose my peace. Because I know how it works. This is a season. If you are struggling to trust the Lord, if you're struggling to choose door number two, if you look around your life and you're not bearing fruit in some areas, it's probably because you don't trust the Lord in that area. And that's simply, so the, the solution is to draw close because when I know the storyline, when I know how God works, it doesn't matter if things are, are shaking all around me. It doesn't matter if I'm in the midst of a world that is rocked by uncertainty. It doesn't matter what I read on the news. It doesn't matter what conversations I could be in. It doesn't matter what's on my social media feed. I know who God is. I know his nature. I know his character. I know how he operates and I know how he moves. I know the storyline that's unfolding because I know God. And I've read my Bible, and what I know is this, is that when the world has been burned down around me, when I seem to be standing in ashes, that I serve a God who brings beauty from ashes. That I may be standing in ashes, but what's coming next is beauty. I may be weeping throughout the night, but I know this, that I may feel heavy in the night. There may be mourning throughout the night. There may be weeping throughout the night. But what I know is this, is because I know my God. I know the nature and character of how he works. And I know this, I may be weeping throughout the night. But the sun is going to come up. And when the sun comes up, joy will come in the morning. I know that he will never leave me and he will never forsake me. 
I know that when I look around and I see sin all around me abounding, I know when I see sin abounding that grace is about to show up in force, that grace is about to show up on the scene because the Bible says that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And I may look around the nation and see sin abounding. I know the storyline. I know how God works. I have intimately drawn close to God. I know his nature and I know his character. And I know that where sin is flourishing, Grace is about to come in force and show its strength. I know that the righteous have never been forsaken. I know that those children of the righteous have never had to beg for bread because this is my God. He is my provider, and he is not connected to a world system. He is not connected to a world economy. I want to tell you right now, I believe that this is a season of revealing. God is trying to give you prophetic clarity where he is saying, listen, this season of disruption is trying to get you to a place of greater fruitfulness. That the season of disruption in Jerusalem is trying to lead you to revival in Samaria. And God wants to bring you to a place of fruitfulness in your life. But he first has to reveal to you where you have been leaning and trusting in something other than him. You've been trusting in man. And the invitation is to draw close to him in intimacy because door number two is the choice that must be made if you're going to bear fruit. I want to pray for you right now because I believe that this is what God is calling us to, that God is bringing the church into a great hour of fruitfulness. I believe that what is ahead is a, is a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit that will reap a harvest that is unprecedented in our times. I believe that we are going to see the power of God break out. And I believe that the church is going to step in to a season of fruitfulness because we have chosen to trust God. Because we've chosen to trust God. Father, I pray. We, we just come today and we say, God, we choose door number two. Father, I say thank you that you have revealed to us areas that we have not put our trust in you. And today we choose door number two. We choose door number two in our marriage and in our finances and in our health and in our future and in our city and in our nation and in our job. We choose door number two. God, I'm asking that every person watching this, you would bring them into a great season of fruitfulness. God, you're trying to get them to greater fruitfulness for Radiant and the entire church. God, that you would bring them to a place of great fruitfulness. I just bless them in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would draw close to us in intimacy. God, I need you to draw close to me in intimacy. I, I, want, I want to see the Father. Amen. Amen. Listen, I would encourage you. It's a little bit hard just on uh, just over this video camera, but but man, take some time. Take inventory of your life. Sit with the Lord and say, God, what areas have I chosen to trust man over you? Look at your life and maybe go, what are the areas that aren't bearing fruit? And are they not bearing fruit because I've chosen to trust man instead of you? Guys, thanks so much for having me with you. Absolutely love and adore you guys. I cannot wait to be with you again in person sometime. But just know this, we are standing with you and praying for revival in our day.